talking, okay, we're talking, <clears throat> we're talking about the seven marks of discipleship, and so we've been working through that in our little puzzle, so look at the back of your bulletin there, if you haven't done so before, and we've got this little puzzle that we're working out, the seven marks of discipleship, and so our first little letter there was G, and G is for generosity, believers are generous. They hilariously give to God. They're generous. Then our next little letter that came up was P is for prayer. Christians pray. They're in constant communication with God. Then our next little letter that we worked on was W is for worship. And we said worship kind of comes in two different forms. It comes in a corporate sense, but it also comes in a personal sense. So we talked about getting, finding your chair and carving out a time out of your day where it's just you and the Lord, where you actually step into the light of God and let God shine his life upon you and reflect, you reflect upon him. It's just for him. Part of your day is just for him in a personal sense. But we don't stay there. We get out of our chair and we come to a place like this where we meet with each other. And then C was our next word. C was for community. And so church is not a corporation. It's a community of faith. And so we get together and we worship the Lord. We work together. And then we also, S is for service, we also serve with each other. So our faith is active after we become Christians. And we know that we can express our love to God by expressing our love to each other. And not only within here, but out in the world as well. And then last week, we brought up the, uh, the other mark, the sixth mark of uh, discipleship. E is for evangelism and so we kind of introduced that last week and I want to talk to you some more about that today now remember in the church um, we have a couple uh, different purposes one of our purpose <clears throat> is to mature the body to help everybody grow up in their faith but we don't stop there we all want to get out of our chair together if you will and then reach beyond the confines of this building, of this assembly. We want to get outside where the other folks are who don't know the Lord, who don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And God wants to use you and he wants to use me to have an outreach, to reach out to the people of the world. So, so it's not us for bar the door. It's no, this is whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. No, it's God loved the whole world that he gave his one and only son. That's the message that we want to get out. So evangelism is translated, as we looked at last Sunday, into the word gospel. That's how it's translated. Uh, we see that in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So what is the gospel? Well, it means good news. And, of course, we need good news because there's bad news, right? And the world uh, needs good news because there's lots of bad news out there. So the gospel means, in some respects, it's speaking about facts, and then it's also talking about one's response. So what are the facts of the gospel? I had to kind of um, think this through more so uh, in depth than I ever had before in my project paper for school. This um, idea, this concept rather, the system of evangelism, the system of the gospel, this, this thing about the good news, what actually happens. And um, one of the things that I learned from the scripture is that God 
<clears throat> gives everyone faith. But not everyone's faith is active. In fact, if you're not a believer, your faith is dormant. And faith is kind of like leaven. Um, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 33, bring that verse up for us if you have it, uh, Annabelle. Another parable, Jesus spoke to them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven or yeast, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. So I, I, I was thinking about yeast, and so I went in the office uh, before I left for the day on Friday and asked Penny, I said, tell me about yeast. And so I said, does ye, how does yeast work when it just sits there? Does it, does it help the bread if you just throw some yeast in there? Does it help the dough if you just throw some in there? And she said, well, no. She said, what you need to do to make the yeast active is you need to pour some and she said, warm water, right? Warm water. I, I got that right? So Penny, Penny got it right. So warm water. And then what happens to the yeast? Then it becomes what we can say activate. It activates, doesn't it? It explodes. It li there's literally an explosion. And it permeates as you, as you knead it into the dough. It permeates all the dough. And, of course, that's what makes the dough rise. And that's what makes it taste so good. Well, God has given every person faith. But that faith is dormant when you're a lost person, when you're in darkness, when you're separated from God. And so here's what happens. <clears throat> God, through his word, and that's a critical statement, through his word, through the hearing of his word, and of course if you're reading it, you're, you're hearing it like the Ethiopian eunuch. Remember, he was reading the book of Isaiah, but he didn't understand it. Philip came by and explained the gospel to him through his ears, so he actually was getting it through his eyes and his ears. But through the hearing of the gospel, when one hears the gospel, then the Holy Spirit activates, stirs up that dormant faith so that one can then believe in the facts of Jesus Christ. Now, what are the facts? The facts are that Jesus Christ is not a lesser God. He is God. It, 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 sometimes you'll hear people say, well, uh, uh, Jesus and God. They'll, they'll say that in the same state. Jesus is God. He is God the Son. He is the second person of the Trinity. So God the Father sent God the Son and added humanity to himself, added humanity to him. In the womb of Mary, he was born a man, but still God at the same time, lived his life, and then died on the cross. And on the cross, there God the Father took all of your sins and my sins and placed them on Jesus Christ. And when he died, he paid the debt that you owed God. Now, he was buried, and then he rose again from the grave. He ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of the Father. He's the only way to the Father. He's the only way to eternal life. He's the only way to forgiveness of sin. That's all the facts. That doesn't save you. But you need to get that far. But you need to go one more step. Uh, we could find that step in John chapter 1 and verse 12. We could find it. Well, here's a good text in John chapter 5 and verse 24. Let's put that verse up there. I love this verse. John chapter four, 5 and verse 24. I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. I love that. The Israelites they were slaves in Egypt, but the day came when God took them and they crossed over the Red Sea. They crossed over from slavery and death into the promised land. Now that's what happens when a person who hears the gospel, God activates their faith through the Holy Spirit. He stirs it up so now they have the opportunity to believe in Jesus Christ. And when they receive him into his life, they cross over in that moment in time from death to life, from darkness to light. 
That's the gospel. That's the good news. This gospel is what we're called to share. So not only do we understand what it is, we need to understand what we're supposed to do with it. God gave us an imperative. He gave us a command. And the Great Commission in Matthew 28, go, that's a, that's a command, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all the things that I've commanded you. This is the last words that Jesus left his disciples. So why would we go and share the gospel with other people? Because God has commanded us to do that, not the preacher, all of us. This is a mark of discipleship. If you claim to be a follower of Jesus and you never share your faith, are you really a follower? Are you really following? I mean, if you're following what Jesus commanded you to do, then you're going to be doing what he's commanding you to do, right? And he commanded us to go and share. But if we're not doing that, ah, Lee, that, that doesn't look real well. That doesn't sink real well. No, and so some of us, as Christians, part of this message is designed to help us, give us a catalyst, give us a little boost to get started. So last Sunday, what was your assignment? Anybody remember? Oh, that's right. Way to go, Jesse. Three people, you're going to write them down, and you're going to, who you think might not know the Lord. Now, we can't look in anybody's heart. But, you know, like if somebody tells me they're not a Christian, they tell me they're agnostic, they tell me, you know, they don't have anything to do with God, well, I pretty well know they're not a Christian. So three people that I believe possibly, maybe probably, you know, somewhere in there, they're not believers. They don't know the Lord. They don't have a personal relationship with God. And I'm going to start praying for them. So many of you got your list together and you wrote your three names down. And that's what we call prayer in our little circle. We have this little circle of evangelism. So we're trying to get more people involved in the Great Commission because you not only want to share the gospel because God commanded you to do that because it's a lot of fun. You don't want to miss out on the fun. And you don't want to get to heaven having not planted the seed or watered the seed or actually led one person to Christ when you get to heaven. I think that's what Jesus was talking about when he told his disciples, make sure you make lots of friends in heaven. That's what you want to be a part of. And I'm telling you, it's fun. It's exciting. So we got a bunch of you started last week. And if you weren't here last week, get your list. Get three people on there. And you're going to be adding to it. But start with three and start praying for them. Now, this is not only what it is, but why we want to share it. Now, let's talk about how to share it. Strategy. Okay? We have our mission. We have our values. But what's our strategy? There's lots of ways to share the gospel. Uh, one way, of course, is through one verse evangelism. And I, I like this way. It helps people. It puts something in their hand. It gives them a visual aid. So you get a legal pad if you have somebody that you're going to share with. By the way, let's do this. <clears throat> because things have changed in our culture and really around the world, but mostly in our culture. Uh, we still have quite a bit of this going on in other places in the world, but in America, it's pretty well stopped. But um, some of you have never heard of Billy Graham, right? A lot of you have. I didn't show this in the early service because it's all the old people. <laughs> they all know who Billy Graham is. Okay, but some of you don't know, and you, you, some of you don't know what used to happen, okay? Now, I'm going to show you a little clip. It's only 45 seconds long, but it's when Billy Graham had all his hair, and there wasn't a gray one in there. He is young. This is in black and white. It's not in color. This is at Madison Square Garden. They were going to have like a two-week crusade. The whole thing's filled up. went on for 12 weeks because people kept getting saved. Okay. So he used to preach all over the world like this. You don't see much. Franklin does a little bit of it. I mean, he gets it where he can. It's not like it used to be. The culture's changed. And I just want to give you a little idea of, of what evangelism looked like for a lot of us as we were growing up, for me, when I was much younger. Let's show that little clip, Annabelle. 
Are you sure tonight? Are you sure that you're a Christian? Are you sure that your sins are forgiven? Are you sure if you died you'd go to heaven? Are you sure that you're ready to meet God? In the strictest sense of the term, I ask you tonight, are you a Christian? Are you sure of it? If I had a doubt in my heart tonight that I was ready to meet God, you couldn't drag me out of Madison Square Garden till I'd settled it. Make sure. Give your life to Christ tonight. Come and receive him. All right, that's a Christian. Christ dwelling in the heart. A personal encounter with Christ. Receiving Christ as Savior and Lord. That is a Christian. <laughs> Powerful, isn't it? Uh, some of the people here have never seen that before. They've never seen Billy Graham. And of course, when I saw Billy Graham, he was much older, and he had, he had mellowed out a lot. Okay? He still, he preached the same message. He didn't get there. He didn't get way up there, you know, like he used to. And that was actually a light version. Okay? Uh, he started out in Hollywood with the Tent Revival, and scores of people got saved. Powerful stuff. You think about evangelism when you think about that. Now, today, 75 to 80 percent of the people who come to know the Lord don't do so through an event anymore. They do so through a relationship that they have with somebody else. This is where we come in, okay? Now, when I say relationship, I don't mean that you have to be in a relationship with somebody for 10 years before you share. I'm talking about just a one-on-one. -on -one. There's some kind of contact between you and another person, okay? That's how most people come to know the Lord today, all right? Now, I wish we could get back to some of that, you know? I wish we could. Uh, maybe that's something we should start praying about because you could see how powerful it is, preaching the Word of God, having a man of God like, and they call, by the way, this is so old, when they introduced him, they called him Mr. Graham. They didn't call him Dr. Graham. So this was a long time ago. So what we've got to do is we've got to say, well, I want to be a part of this. I want to be a part of helping people come to know the Lord, passing from death to life. I'm starting to sound like Dr. Graham, aren't I? <laughs> well, one of the ways we could do that, lots of ways, but it's through one verse evangelism, okay? You can get the legal pad with somebody and you have something in your hand, something to write on so they're not looking at you all the time. And you just write that verse, Romans 6, 23 out. It's so simple. And then you're going to write, after you write it out, you're going to say the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. I mean, where'd you get all those words? Right from that verse, Romans 6, 23. You don't have to memorize anything. And you're going to say, here's where you are, and here's where God is. And you can't jump far enough to get over there, and so here's where you are. We want justice. Can you imagine working for two weeks for your employer, and your employer doesn't give you your check? He says, I'm not paying you. You would say, well, that's not fair. Listen, we want what's fair, and God wants to give you what's fair for your sins. Because we have missed God's target. Because we have missed God's mark, because we have broken God's law, we deserve death. This is what God has said, because God is a just judge. And that's what we call bad news. And we don't want to stay here, and God doesn't want us to stay there either. We want to be over here with the Lord. What do we need? This verse tells us, for the wages of sin is death. And then the most important word in the New Testament, but beautiful word, connecting word, but the gift of God is eternal life. A gift is not something we deserve. A gift is not something we work for. A gift is something only God can give, which is eternal life. Now, those are the facts. I went through this very fast with you. You understand. Those are the facts of the gospel. Will that save you? No, there has to be a response. John chapter 1 and verse 12, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, John chapter 5 and verse 24. We must receive the Lord into our life. And by the way, John, by the way, Mary, 
I would like to pray a little prayer with you and lead you so that you can ask Jesus Christ to come into your life right now if you'd like to do that, right? So that's one verse. Of, that's one way we can do it. And how do you get good at doing that? How do you get good at doing anything? You practice. Say, so well, nobody in my family will let me practice on them. Do you have a dog? Do <laughs> you have a potted plant? Find something. Start practicing. Because if you'll start practicing and you'll start praying, God's going to give you somebody to talk to. I promise you. By the way, put our little circle up there, okay? So let's talk about strategies. That's just one way, okay? Now, I told you I'm praying for Malta. He was our German exchange student that came over, and the boys introduced me to him, went back to Germany. He's back in, he told me he's an atheist. I know he's lost. I know his family is in the same place. So I'm praying for Malta, and I'm praying for his family. I got them at the top of that circle. Now, the care part, that's the strategy part. What am I going to do now? Well, I don't live in Germany. So here's what I'm doing. I'm praying that God, and he's in the university right now, I think in Norway, I'm praying that God will bring a believer in his life who can, he can become friends with, Malte, so that he can trust and share the gospel. I'm praying for that. And I'm praying that for his family. I'm not just praying for him. I want his whole family to get saved. So I'm praying and I'm asking God. That's a strategy that I have. We need all kinds of strategies to, to, to reach different people. So Jim Dippery, 10 years ago, shows up at our church, he and his wife, Lorraine, she had a disease that eventually took her life five years later, five years ago. So they came to church. I went out to their house. I went and visited with Lorraine and Jim inside the house. We talked about the good news. Lorraine was so excited and asked the Lord to come into her life. Whoa. Okay. Was that me? Okay. And where was I? Jim. So Jim walks me outside the door and he says, hey, I just want to thank you for coming and seeing us today and saying everything you said to Lorraine, but just let me let you know, I don't need any of that stuff. I'm an agnostic. It's good for Lorraine. I don't need it. Just to let you know, but hey, thanks for coming. Now, what are you going to do for Jim? Well, here's what I did. I said, Jim, I said, I appreciate your honesty. I said, would you consider reading the book? He said, what kind of book? I said, well, I got this book back in my office. It's called A Skeptic's Approach to God. Sounds like you. And I said, this guy, Frank, grew up in church, became an atheist, and he decided to, to disprove the existence of God. And he said, it was only going to take him two weeks, and it took him five years. And he came to a different conclusion Maybe you might like to read it. See, I didn't want to give him everything. I wanted some curiosity in there. He said, yeah, I could read that book. Jim got back to me one month later and said, Mike, I'm convinced Jesus Christ is God, and I want to ask him to come into my life. He's been here for 10 years. Okay? So what I'm trying to say is, is that sometimes you'll run into people, and, man, you know, maybe their vision is really clouded, really involved, really complex. I mean, being an agnostic and atheist is different than just finding somebody that grew up in a Baptist church and lost. And it takes a little, get a book. Now, I don't use that book for every case. Different cases have different books. And so I'm aware of what's out there. And just like when, when um, Francis... My, my little friend up there in the nursing home who's, who's 89 introduced me to her little friend that's 95 who has another friend who's 80 who doesn't believe that Jesus is God but that he's only a prophet. What did I, I said, we got to get her a book. And so I sent her the book, More Than a Carpenter by Josh McDowell. Jesus was either Lord, liar, or lunatic. There are no other choices. Where are you? And I called Frances two days ago. I said, have you heard anything? She said, no, but she's got the book. We believe she's reading it, and we're praying that God will use it to save her at 80 years of age. I don't know how much longer she's got. So a book is sometimes. Now, how many of you out here like to go on a cruise? So raise up your hand. I want to see all the cruise people. Leave it up. Leave it up. Leave it up. We got quite a few cruise people. It's the best mission trip you could possibly go on in your life. 
I'm not kidding. Who do you think works on a cruise ship? People from all over the world. They're all third world country people because they pay them beans to be there, to work 200 hours a week. So here's your assignment. The next time you go on a cruise, I want you to come up here and see Penny and bring one of your suitcases. <laughs> and I want you to fill it up with tracks. Okay? Because, I mean, those people are everywhere, and they're not, they have to be nice to you. And when you give them something, they have to take it. <laughs> and if you're really smart, you'll say, where do they mostly congregate? Back in the kitchen or wherever, and so you can give tons of them out. And you know what will happen if you'll do that? <laughs> There'll be people who will get saved. Gospel tracts are a great way to share your faith. Because a lot of people do not have 30 minutes to talk to you. I mean, you got the cashier, right, at H-E-B. She didn't have 30 minutes. She'd get fired. But she's got like 30 seconds. Hey, have you ever read this? Steps to having peace with God. How to, or, or, taking the good person test. I, I hardly ever have somebody reject it and tell me No. Read this on your break. Read this when you go home. The waitress at the restaurant. Every time that we come in contact with other people, we ought to be thinking, are they going to heaven or hell? Are they saved or lost? Do they have a person? Are they in darkness? Or are they in light? Have they crossed over yet? We ought to be thinking that. That's the way, that's a mark of discipleship. That's that. That's that care part, coming up with a strategy. Jesse, he's sitting back there. He's so excited about the Lord up here. Saying, you can see his smile up here in the choir from ear to ear. How did he get saved? He's our exterminator. He came over to my house. He's killing bugs. I'm thinking to myself, is he going to heaven or hell? Is he in darkness or light? Hey, Jesse. He just stopped killing bugs for a while. I don't know, two months later, he shows up down here at the front. I says, hello, Jesse, what are you doing, man? He said, don't you remember I got saved at your house? I came to tell everybody and to follow the Lord in baptism. This is what you want to be about. Oh, you don't want to skip this part. This is the most important part. Telling other people, I'm so thankful. You remember when I'd been saved and I marked it at 25 years, I found the guy in Lufkin that witnessed to me and I called him on the phone. And I said, thank you. He didn't remember who I was. He had no clue. So I got about seven more years till I hit 50. I'm going to look him up again. <laughs> and I'm going to call him and I'm going to say, thank you. I'm still doing the deal. Whoever led you to the Lord, have you thanked them lately? You ought to thank them if you can find them, if they're still alive. If you don't see them every day, and you may. You know, some of those people are right around you. Oh, boy. We want to share the gospel. All kinds of different ways to do it. We start by praying. Not only by praying for the lost people that we've named, but that God would use us. Now, you want to add that to your prayer. That's your next assignment. See, that preacher, he just opens the door, and once she just says, all I want is your little foot, he says, but the next Sunday, he just opens it wide open, and he just throws you in there. He's always a hook with everything that he does. He always wants more. That's right. Come back next Sunday. See, we have a prayer, and then that prayer, you know what it does? It starts making us where we start caring. God, change my heart. Give me a burden. Give me compassion for lost people. Help me to be concerned and want to be involved. See, it's not just for the lost people we're praying. We're also praying for ourselves. 
Help me to care. God, give me a strategy. Help me to help this person come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be a follower of Jesus. I want to share my faith. I may not be very good at it right now, but I can get a potted plant and I can start practicing. And of course, you don't have to know anything to give a track. Just give it to people. What's in here? I have no idea, but you, the preacher said you should read it. <laughs> That's where we are. Billy Graham, we'll close with this in his video. Did you hear what he said? He said, you'd have to drag me out of here if I didn't know that Jesus Christ was my Lord and Savior. Don't leave this place without knowing that. Let's pray. Is there somebody here today, first time, been here for 50 years, somebody here today who doesn't know that they know that they know that they've crossed over? You can know right now. If you believe the facts, here's the response. Let me lead you in this little prayer. And you can ask the Lord to come in your life right now. Dear Lord Jesus, just say it with me. Dear Lord Jesus, save me. Be my Lord. Forgive me. Come into my life and take over. Make me the kind of person that you want me to be. Change my life. I believe that you died on the cross for me to pay for my sins. I believe that you rose again from the grave and that you're alive. Lord, take me to heaven when I die. Thank you for coming into my life just now. Thank you, Lord, for saving me today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer this morning, welcome to the family of God. God keeps all his promises and he'll keep that one to you. Now I want us to bow our heads again as we go into our invitation. And I want you to reflect on prayer, care, and share. As you're praying for the lost people that you've listed or that you're going to list, I want you to pray about yourself. Asking God to make you a great commission Christian. One who is willing to share the gospel. Ask the Lord to help you. Ask the Lord for strategies. Ask the Lord to give you a burden and compassion for lost people so that their faith that's dormant now can be activated with the warm water of the Word. 